Run forth resources. We trade on the CSE symbol is RFR. Uh, we're well positioned in um, Canada, specifically in Quebec, with a nice property in Ontario as well. We're exposed both to the gold market, which Bill Love, I, I, I agree with you, hopefully higher. However, let's not lose sight of the fact that gold where it is right now is a very attractive price to Canadian gold miners. Um, and we're also exposed to polymetallic, the nickel, copper, zinc complex with our recent uh, Suramo discovery. So let's get going. Let's see if I can achieve this. Boom. There we go. So what I tell people is we have the right rocks at the right time in the right location. Uh, right rocks. I touched on that already. We have gold properties. We have an open pit gold resource next door to Canada's largest gold mine, which is currently also an open pit. We also have a recent um, VMS, uh, nickel rich VMS discovery, also adjacent to the same Canada's largest gold mine, which is the Canadian Malartic mine. But more interestingly, um, we're only approximately 20 kilometers south of the Laurent mine, which is the uh, the the crown jewel in the, the Agnico Eagle pantheon of properties. Uh, Laurent is a VMS, a gold rich VMS mine. But VMS is a well known story in the Abitibi as well, in as much as uh, you know our bulk tonnage gold that we have at Parbeck. So right location. We are, for um, numerous of our properties, we are in Quebec. We're specifically in the Abitibi uh, Gold Belt. Uh, and we also have a property on the Nix, on the uh, Dester Porcupine in Ontario, which is still in the Abitibi. Uh, it is 10 kilometers southwest of the Timmins, uh, Timmins West and Bell Creek mines, which are in production with uh, Pan American Silver. So right time. What I'm speaking to there is the fact that we do have robust metals prices, be it gold or nickel, uh, copper, zinc, they're all doing well. Uh, and I think we're seeing around the world, we're gonna see some, uh, some factors that cause the prices of the metals to stay where they are, which translates into uh, very good cash flow situations for miners and puts the onus on miners to replace the ounces that they're selling. There's a quote in the presentation, which I'm not reading my presentation to you as you figured out by now. Uh, but there's a quote in there that the spend on GNA is um, <clears throat> typically much higher than the spend on uh, on um, exploration that most majors rolled up and closed the door on exploration years ago. Um, so that's a good position for small resource companies like Renforth. We are a junior resource company with a very nice open pit gold junior, you know, small resource. So moving along, this is the, um, the crux of our property portfolio is in and around, um, Malartic West, um, sorry, Malartic Quebec. Mm, I want to move that is in the wrong spot. Okay. So Malartic Quebec, Canadian Malartic mine is right here. And John, can you move my little face off the brushes? Let's see. Ah, there we go. I did it. Okay. Canadian Malartic mine is right here. This is uh, Canada's largest open pit gold mine. Um, it is, it is in production. It turns 60,000 tons of rock per day. Uh, we have adjacent to that, the little, um, the little red box that's backwards is our Parbeck. Um, this worked earlier. It's not allowing me to draw. That's helpful. No, it's not working. So the backwards L adjacent to Canadian Malartic is our Parbeck uh, gold deposit. It's an open pit deposit. It's 281,000 ounces at the moment of gold uh, in an open pit shell and immediately outside the open pit shell. Last fall, we commenced a 15,000 meter drill program on this. We completed 9,600 of those meters. And in about a week or two, you'll hear me say that the drill is back on site to drill the balance of those meters, to drill an additional um, 5,000 uh, 5, meters. So that's exciting and important because we're building value right here. We will be restating this resource in the spring. Uh, we will use... Um, we will build, rebuild our geological model based on the findings of our drilling. We have been drilling under existing intercepts. We've also been drilling in between existing drill holes. And we are going to actually twin 
and repeat some of the drilling from the 1980s. We're doing that because we want to bring those ounces into the resource, and you'll see what I mean in a little bit. We also have our Malartic West property. Um, Malartic West is also adjacent to the Canadian Malartic Mine. It is south of the Cadillac Break, and it's the site of a copper-silver discovery we made a little while ago. Then we have our huge Suramo property. It's tied onto the south side of Malartic West, and it's tied onto the west side of the Canadian Malartic Mine. Suramo hosts a total of 50 kilometers of geophysical and geological um, features or anomalies, and we actually drilled on one of those, as we'll see shortly, and we do consider that a new discovery, and to help with that new discovery, we actually brought on one of uh, a worldwide expert in VMS. So, this is a detail of our Parbeck slide. You can see Parbeck relative to Canadian Malartic, and I want to draw your attention specifically to the, um, the relationship with, uh, now I can draw, with East Amphi, so let's do that better now that it works. This right here, this is East Amphi. East Amphi has been the site of some drilling by Agnico Eagle and Yamana, who jointly hold Canadian Malartic privately. They disclosed a large low-grade gold occurrence, I think was the word they used there, as well as a high-grade um, intrusive. The relationship between our Parbeck and East Amphi is there right on strike. Where it gets interesting is Canadian Malartic is currently an open pit deposit, but Odyssey and off of the slide, the East Gouldy deposit are where they're going to get their next feed. And they're going to have to go underground. Those are deep discoveries. They will need ounces when they go underground to keep the mill turning. That's where we could see strategically East Amphi and Parbeck come into the picture. So that's very exciting. That's uh, also the reason we continue to drill to, at Parbeck. We're going to do our next resource, perhaps not with the focus on the open pit shell, but with a focus on just increasing and delineating as many ounces as we can at Parbeck. This is the current resource statement at Parbeck. That was calculated in May 2020. It's engineered, and it's only including assay results from 2007 to the present because we have all of that core. You did hear me say I'm twinning some drill holes, things like this, the 1980s holes, the 1990s holes. They are not in the existing resource statement. Um, this is an interval table that gives you a look at high grades that have occurred within the drilling to date at Parbeck and long intercepts. Now, this table actually doesn't include any of the results from our drilling that started last fall. We drilled 27 holes. We've only press released, we've only received the results on five of those holes. So we have 22 drill holes yet to come out um, from the fall. And we're going to start drilling again. Right now, the guys are in the field. They're still splitting core. There were seven holes that they didn't get a chance to split before they went home for Christmas. So they're splitting those holes and submitting those to the lab as we speak. So we're going to have assay results coming out now through to the end of February from last year's work. And then maybe by early March, we'll have assays from this year's work coming out, and that'll continue well into April. So lots of assay results to come, comparable to what we already did. We press released the other day, I think it was 13.2 meters or 13 meters at 1.7 grams per ton, if my memory serves, was the last, and that was in the sediments. So that, I mean, that's comparable on the basis of we do see long widths at Parbeck, but we also see high grades. So we can give you both, uh, but we're definitely a bulk tonnage um, gold deposit with a nugget effect. That's the easiest way to sum par Parbeck up. Parbeck has gold occurring in three different settings. In the Cadillac break, we did, whoa, didn't press, didn't stop drawing a line, sorry. In the Cadillac break, the blue area, we also discovered gold in the yellow area with these diorite intrusives in the sediments. And in fact, that 13 meters that I just quoted came from right about, if memory serves, right about there in the sediments well outside of the pit shell. And we also have the island trench, which as you read my presentation, you'll see is currently the deepest pierce point on the property. However, the next drill hole that we don't have back yet, uh, I can't even see it on here. Um, where is it? 105. 
this drill hole is the next one that's going to be press released. That drill hole will be the deepest pierce point on the property in the Cadillac break because the current deepest pierce point, as you saw in the presentation, is associated with the volcanics in the north. So I'm excited to see this drill hole, the results. We don't have them yet. Expecting them any day now. So I told you we did a lot of drilling in the fall. And actually, I'm, I don't think all the drill holes are on this model because I haven't updated it. But the deepest pierce point is, you're not going to see it because I'm drawing with a black pen. But the deepest pierce point on the property in the Cadillac break is going to be this hole right here, which is hole 105. You will see as we move through the presentation that our drilling in red here, where the drill holes are in red, you see them outside of the pit. When they're in the pit, the color changes slightly. But in any case, the point of this drilling, you can see it's dispersed throughout. In this area, the drilling was infill in between existing holes or down dip of existing holes. And you can see with the spacing, we didn't do a lot of drilling in this portion of the property. And in fact, our next program is going to focus on this portion of the property, as well as twinning holes in here, which is the camp zone and where the bulk of the drilling on the property is. So we're not, we're, we're drilling with deliberate intent to resolve discrepancies. For example, this sort of spacing is 50 meters. And for an engineer, they like to see the tighter drill holes in here. So that's why we drill what we call infill. Um, we're getting good results. Uh, we're pleased with our drilling to date, and we were certainly happy as the core came out of the drill uh, in the fall. So we we're expecting to see those results shortly. This uh, slide, I have to actually do my modeling homework and update because we did get results for 104. But this shows you this jagged blue line is the pit contour. All of these drill holes, with the exception of the shallowest, these are all 1980s drill holes. Drilling 104 and this hole, which I'm not putting my glasses on again, but um, that's, that's a post-1980s hole as well. This entire area is a void of assay data. So we drilled 104. It'll bring, we'll, we have to actually do another hole in here. But results from 104 combined with results from this hole can lend confidence to these values. And then we're going to this uh, spring actually twin some of these holes. So we're, we're doing all of this with a view to building out our resource model at Parbeck. Uh, Parbeck, phenomenally exciting, and it just never stops giving. It gives us a gold at every turn. Um, it's 1.8 kilometers of gold, and it definitely has a future. Does it have a future as uh, Renforth building it and operating it as a toll mill? Perhaps, but I think it has a very real chance of featuring into somebody's need for ounces. We've seen a lot of M&A in the camp. Uh, we've seen a lot of, we see mines that are needing to replace their ounces. Um, we've got El Dorado has just moved to acquire future ounces. We've got uh, I Am Gold with Westwood. They've, they're trying to add ounces to keep their mill running. They had to close the mine. Um, and then we've got Canadian Malartic, which continues to spit out ounces, and they're going to have to transition as they're now at the bottom of their pit. They're going to transition to underground and perhaps need a bit of bulk as they transition. So that's all very exciting for, for Parbeck. And we will be, as I told you, drilling and stay tuned. Lots of news to come. But what else are we doing at the same time? Well, we have our Suramo property with our 50 kilometers of geophysical and geological features in orange there. And then we have Malartic West with our little copper silver discovery. Um, and it's pretty darn close, as you can see, to the Cadillac break. So we, uh, we're, we're working on both of those to some extent. Malartic West is the poor uh, stepsister in the picture because it's not going to see a lot of love. It'll get a little bit of attention this summer, but over, I think it's 175 meters, we've traced copper and uh, reasonable silver grades on surface. We don't know anything else about it. Um, it is a puzzle and we'll probably do some um, surface geophysics with a beat mat this summer um, just to try and trace that anomaly a bit further as it's under cover of not not significant but dirt and trees get in the way that leaves us with surimo surimo uh if i go back to this slide 
where the little red box is, we drilled uh, 200 meters. It was meant to be a thousand meter program. However, we were using a uh, newly built drill um, and the operator stands out in the elements. So we were pushing the envelope with late October repeated uh, blizzards and the, um, and the and then it would thaw and it became a sucking sea of mud. So between equipment and weather, we only got 200 meters drilled, but man, I'm glad we got those 200 meters drilled. We drilled, as I showed you in between um, areas of existing work, historic work from the 1990s and the 1940s at uh, Suramo on the Southern geophysical trend. Specifically, this area was known historically as Victoria West, and it had trenching, largely trenching done by LAC in the 1990s, but it did see erratic drilling in the 1990s and earlier, and um, they were looking at zinc. And uh, as well, uh, there's, a, there's a VMS with an ultramafic beside it, so there's nickel numbers, and it's a bit of a puzzle. So it's funny, uh, I announced today the uh, appointment of uh, Senior Principal Advisor on, um, on Suramo as being Dr. Jim Franklin. And when this came about, and when we, when we got this property, I, I got in touch with Jim Franklin. I said, so I've secured all the ground. Um, what, what are your thoughts? What's your familiarity? And he said, I have that in a filing cabinet in Ottawa because when I was with the GSC and did a survey of the camp, that was a question mark. It's a question mark that's never been explained. So I had filed it away as one of my let's figure it out one day files. So I took him up on that and we're, he's going to help us figure it out. So as I said, we did our 200 meters of drilling. I should mention that there is gold on Suramo, uh, low grade, fairly large intervals, as well as some surface information. Uh, we, Renforth, went to Lalonde, we went to Victoria West, we went to Colony. In between, it's a giant swamp with uh, with not great access for men on feet foot in the middle of the summer, late and in the fall. Uh, we did go as far as we could on Victoria West, but we've been on the property. We haven't been up here yet since I acquired it, and we've prospected and we've got surface numbers everywhere. Um, so we have a degree of confidence in our historical data, and uh, combined with our drilling, um, we now have uh, Victoria West. This is five kilometers of historical information combined with Renforth stone data. Now, I had a conversation with someone in the industry who said, well, are you sure it's there? What is it? Is it real? And the explanation is, yes, it's there. However, in the 1990s, LAC drilled, and they drilled the edge of the magnetic anomaly in south. And in the 40s, we don't know what they were doing there. So we drilled in between. We've got 200 meters. It lines up with a, with a geophysical high. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of geological thought going into what's happening right now. Fundamentally, very simplistically, I can tell you that it looks like the VMS was fed by adjacent graphite and the ultramafic. So, um, the VMS that we know is there is a peculiar or a unique looking one, but it's not without precedent around the world. Uh, we are awaiting assay information that can be publicly disclosed. Largely, we're awaiting Dr. Franklin to give me something that uh, that can be disclosed. Um, but that's exciting. You will see us when we're done our drill program at Parbeck. We will take a break, and then we will be drilling at Suramo, probably in an, a, an initial 2,000 to 2,500 meters. Now, what else do we have planned? So we've we've got uh, we've got results to come. We've got drilling starting shortly at Parbeck. Results from that to come. Then drilling at Suramo. Upon receipt of all the Parbeck results, uh, starting upon the completion of the drilling with the geologists using their logs, but upon the completion of all the results, receipt of all the results for Parbeck, we'll be handing off our geological model to a resource geologist for a resource update. And the other thing we'll have going on, um, for sure, is Nixon Bartleman in Ontario. Um, that timeline takes us right into June of this year, and we have the funds on hand. We're sitting on, I think it's... 2.6 or $7 million in cash, along with our 12 million shares of um, Radisson. And uh, the 12 million shares of Radisson, you know, has a present value of around $4 million, but uh, it's a longer term investment that can provide us cash flow in the future. But with all of that money, we will in fact go out to see our Nixon Bartleman property. Um, here's the Timmins West mine. 
Um, we're also just northeast of Penn Gold, GFG Resources, Penn Gold property. But on uh, Nixon Bartleman, we have 500 meters of gold uh, in quartz on surface. We have evidence of on echelon veining. We have, we're sitting on the Dester Porcupine Fault with a well-known regionally identified cross fault coincident with a, with, a, with a geochemical anomaly that we haven't actually followed up on yet. So we're going to do that this summer. Um, Nixon Bartleman hosts spectacular gold in quartz, but it also, and here's a 22 grams over 0.3 meters in a channel that we cut. So it's got, it's got the gold, it's got the goods. It's wholly owned as well. And it's in Ontario on patent ground. So it couldn't be better. Um, so like I said, we're funded. So as a shareholder, why, um, why do you care? Well, we're going to add value. We've got world-class assets in a tiny little company. Uh, you can see that they're world-class by the fact that we can bring world-class expertise to bear on these assets. Uh, we will be drilling. We're putting the money in the ground where it should go. We will continue to prove um, excellent endowment of metals at both Surimo and Parbeck and at Nixon Bartleman. Malartic West will get a little bit of love. Um, geophysically speaking, at least. And um, our other Quebec property, Denain Pershing, is optioned out to O3. So we've got lots going on, little tiny company, um, marketing efforts ongoing to get the word out, to spread the word. So please tell all your friends. Uh, and I think you can see, um, you can see lots coming up from the point of view of uh, a shareholder. Of course, um, do your own due diligence. I'm the president and CEO of the company. I'm hardly impartial. And I'm 25 minutes into this. I don't think I've talked the entire 25 minutes. Lord knows I could talk another 25 minutes. But there's lots to talk about. It's real. The money goes in the ground. Um, I'm not a promoter. I'm not, I'm not making you wild promises. I'm just telling you what we got going on. So if that is of interest, um, get on board and let me see. Uh, John, have I, have I run through the allocated amount of time or should I keep talking? Cause I can. There you are. I can hear you now. Uh, it's your time. If you want to keep going, if you think there's more information that people would like to hear, I mean, by all means, it's, uh, it's no set time. So, well, no, it's really just, it's, it's, uh, we will have a drill arriving in about a week. We'll have, uh, assays from our new lab. Uh, we did switch labs and we have seen, uh, data start to come in from them. So we'll be publicly announcing, I would expect parback assays in the next, I would expect we'll have stuff in hand to announce between Parbeck and Suramo in the next two weeks. Um, you know, do I talk to other companies? What's the M&A potential, which I'm sure is what a lot of people are wondering. Let me tell you, Parbeck is of interest to parties. Uh, but Suramo is also of interest because Suramo is truly a new discovery and that's always exciting. Um, Suramo is interesting. And again, the focus of the company is Parbeck. We're adding value. Suramo is exciting though. There's not a lot of spending on Suramo as yet. But if you look at Suramo on a macro scale, it's a nickel, it's a sulfide nickel. Some initial assay tests we did to determine the kind of nickel gave us about 70% sulfide nickel, which is important because sulfide nickel is the easily processed nickel. So it's high nickel, it's high zinc. There is copper. We saw little bits of copper in the drilling, which was a surprise because we didn't see much copper, if any, uh, on surface. Um, in, in a VMS, the structure controls where various metals land in the structure. So uh, seeing a little bit of copper is exciting and it, it speaks to the potential of more copper. And these base metals are all in demand. And if we're headed the way of various stimulus rebuild infrastructure uh, efforts, as well as the EV revolution, um, these metals are all strategic. So that's gonna get very exciting. Uh, but at the same time, we trundle along adding ounces to our, to our wonderful little uh, gold deposit you can drive to and then go out for beers afterwards. So, you know, in town, wearing city clothes and your, your town shoes. So no helicopters needed, nothing like that. So we're probably the last little fish in a camp of big boys. So uh, they're looking at that asset as well. So that's really all I got to say. I'm sure I've forgotten something, but maybe someone will have a question that'll point out what I forgot. 
Yeah, exactly. Sometimes the Q and A prompts a good discussion. So, well, thanks for the update, uh, Nicole. A number of questions have come in, so we'll we'll get going right away. Cool. Uh, if uh, as we're going here, if you haven't asked a question, but you have one, you know, don't be shy. Throw it in the chat. Um, so first question, any good rumors recently about how Agnico drilling is going at East Amphi? So they're not drilling right now, to my knowledge. Um, our guys are up there, but they're in Val d'Or actually at the core farm splitting core. So they haven't been out to, I lie, they went out, the chipper's gone out and the geo went out to spot holes at Parbeck. Um, I haven't heard that he's seen anything to get to Parbeck. We drive right over East Amphi on the, the the lumber road there's a very good road to parbeck that was put in in the 80s so it's the access for lumber and for hunters and everybody now um he hasn't told me that he has seen anything in the field yet um but i was told they will be drilling approximately another 10,000 meters um i would expect soon um covid is affecting how agnico eagle and yamana are working um, so they have different protocols. We're lucky in that we're small and we have two men who live together uh, who can run the whole program. And the drillers and the geologists are all observing appropriate physical distancing, but they really don't need to come in contact with each other. They can hand off the core and talk from six feet away. So um, I also know from the head geo at Canadian Malartic who ran the drilling, when I was announcing Parbeck uh, results, his comment was, well, at least you're getting your results. So the, the issue of results uh, is frustrating Agnico. They're looking at work around like at, at, new, at having a new uh, prep lab constructed for them because uh, the problem is in the prep. It's not so much in the lab. The lab isn't, labs are in Ontario and Vancouver, but the, all the materials prepped in uh, the Val d'Or in, in the Abitibi, and uh, they just can't uh, prep it fast enough, get staff, you know, staff things appropriately for the amount of material they have going through the lab. So uh, are they drilling? I expect they'll be starting soon. They did drill 9,000 some odd meters last year as press release by Agnico, but far more interestingly, as press released by Yamana, who then went on to acquire the nearby Camflow property with its mill, as well as, I think it was called Wasamac, the deposit uh, west of Rouen that Yamana acquired. So they're a new player on the block. So watch their press releases if you want to hear about um, East Amphi or Canadian Malartic. Uh, next question, are you thinking of migrating over to the TSX Venture? At any point? No, no, it's expensive. And I, I know a number of companies that are thinking of migrating backwards. Um, it doesn't give us any particular uh, benefit except a lot more overhead. Um, what we are doing is we're in the process of, an of the application process for the OTC QB in the United States because we have a funky little uh, US listing that I had nothing, I don't know where it came from, but it's, um, it doesn't, it's a, it's a called market in the States. So we're going to go, we're going to upgrade that to an OTCQB um, listing. The exchange is in the midst of their due diligence amongst all the FINRA and the banks. And they reached out to our lawyer to confirm that our lawyer was in fact our lawyer. Um, and we have a, we have a sponsor slash market maker in the States as well. So that's the, uh, the listing that I'm working on. Any timeline on that, Nicole? Not really. I asked for an update and I got an update yesterday, but it didn't have a timeline attached. So, I mean, the expectation from the OTC exchange when I spoke to them last on this was their own internal due diligence processes would take them through the end of January. Um, but then they reach out like they do. They, they ask for confirmation and, and various things from like FINRA, DTC, a bunch of other, you know, affiliated entities in the securities world. And they don't really have any control of when those guys get back to them. So realistically speaking, if I had to read between the lines, I think we're kind of a mid February before it's 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 done. Mid February, end of February live kind of thing. Um I can see that they're working like our lawyer forwarded me her confirmation back to them that she is in fact our lawyer, et cetera. So. Um, next question from Kurt. Will the COVID travel restrictions affect the upcoming field season? No, our guys are already in Quebec. Um, 
uh, like I said, from our point of view, we have a, a geologist, an OGQ geologist, who's also PGO in Ontario. Um, <clears throat> his helper is a geologist in training. They live together. They, they quarantined before they left and they went up there and they're living in the same apartment. Um, so they're there and the drillers are local as well. So there's no travel component for the drillers and mining is deemed an essential service. Um, all of our guys have permission to travel and they carry it with them. Um, so no, we're good to go. Okay. Uh, next question from Barry. Will you liquidate Radizon shares before raising money uh, via private placement? Hmm. Not sure, Barry. Uh, the Radisson shares are subject to an outright four-month hold as they were issued from Treasury, and I do not believe that hold has expired yet. They were issued at the beginning of October, so they'll they'll be technically technically speaking free in the next couple weeks. Um, but then between Radisson and Renforth, there's a two-way um, agreement with regard to any potential disposition of the shares, which is a it doesn't preclude anything, but it slows it down to, to be cognizant of each other's markets. Um, right now, I don't plan on selling those shares. Uh, right now, I don't plan on raising money. Um, the only reason I would raise money for the next, for the foreseeable future would be if it were a strategic shareholder. If it were, a, you know, a mining company that wants to get a, a toe in the door, then I would definitely consider that. But right now... As we sit today, I have no plans to raise money or to sell the shares. The existing cash on hand, uh, notwithstanding anything else changing, takes us through the planned activities, being the drilling at Parvac, drilling at uh, Surimo, uh, field work at Nixon Bartleman, and a resource restatement. Um, that takes us in terms of timelines through June, and in terms of money on hand, uh, we have sufficient for all of that. Uh, Barry, I hope that answers your question. Uh, Andre is asking about share structure and percentage owned by management. Hey, Andre, uh, percentage, I'm not going to try to do the math in my head right now, but personally, I own eight and a half million shares. Um, I am affiliated with a consulting company that holds probably nine million shares. They're not all mine, unfortunately. Um, our CFO holds, I think, just under eight million shares. Uh, we have one director. Uh, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna try and recall now. the 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 annual statements have uh, a table that was effective at the time the annual statements were published. But we have at least one director who holds. I think it's two directors hold shares um, that I know off the top of my head. So management. I mean, I'm paid in shares, Andre. So um, you know, I'm I'm motivated. But I also realistically, I can't, uh, I can't sell those shares. So, um, you know, we're invested. We're we're working to the same goal that shareholders are working towards. Okay. Uh, question from Lars. Question slash comment. The laboratory has been changed, but the results don't seem to be coming any faster. Uh, results for Sur Surmo should be published by the end of December, or should have been published. When are the next results expected? Uh, uh, so Lars, we switched labs uh, December 17th. We put up, we delivered approximately, well, we delivered five terraform bags on a, on a low riding 18 wheeler to the new lab. They have them all in process. Um, Surimo, <laughs> Surimo, you haven't seen the data le yet. Let me leave it at that. The lab is working. Their turnaround um, understand that the previous lab, our turnaround was 85 days. Uh, the four holes we were able to report from the previous lab who last reported assays to us at the end of last week where they had a batch in the middle of hole 105. That was the last of their assays. Those holes were drilled in September. So the prior lab's turnaround was absolutely abysmal. Uh, the new lab um, has started giving us data. Uh, and they'll be giving us more data. Um, as soon as we get the data, it does not necessarily go out into the public realm, especially when it's data um, on, an, on a new discovery and it's, it's complex data. So we announced the appointment of our principal technical advisor um, today. 
and uh, you can expect to see Sermo results. Um, I would expect maybe sometime next week, otherwise the following week, he has some work to do. So he hit the ground running. Uh, so the new lab's all good. Um, Parbeck results are in process. They updated us with the specific status. A number of the Parbeck results, uh, uh, samples were in the drying stage. Um, so it's moving along. Additional Parbeck information or initial results from the new lab for Parbeck. I mean, we're at Wednesday now. We might see something the end of this week, but realistically, I would expect to start to see Parbeck results again next week. So that has them at just about a six-week turnaround, which is, I mean, it's it's slow compared to where we were a year ago, but or, or a year and a half ago, but it's, it's much better than what we were dealing with uh, with the other lab. So it's, it's working. System is working. Okay. Next question. Uh, how tight will your drill spacing be for your upcoming resource estimate? Do you expect there to be any resources in the measured category? Uh, measured category, I doubt it. I, I'm of the impression, and I'm not a PGO, but I'm of the impression that a resource or an engineer geol wants to see uh these are operating minds that get into the measured category because they just can quantify the data so many more ways than we can with a drill. Uh, what is our spacing going to be? Uh, we're doing two things with the upcoming program. We're twinning 1980s holes. And to do that, we're taking a Tremble GPS system, which is accurate down to the centimeters. We are going out to um, the holes. The callers are no longer in the field. However, in the 1980s, the holes were surveyed. Then the surveyor early on for Renforth, one of the things we had done was the surveyor remeasured his um, his pins, which were still in the field, converted it to UTMs, and he re he presented a UTM survey of all the historic drilling in the 1980s using those UTMs, which are super accurate. We've got super accurate GPS to go out, and we intend to call her within three to five meters of where we expect the historic caller is. So those will be outright twins. We do that in order to um, give confidence to um, people that the, the data is reliable. We still have the geologists from the 1980s, but the lab technology and everything's changed since then. Uh, and people, I've had feedback that the twinning is eagerly anticipated by people. Um, other than that, we'll be drilling in the Northwest and we will be largely undercutting uh, we're looking for 50 meter separation at the point of the mineralization underground. So if you thought in 3D, the 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 collars may be whatever space apart they are, but once the once the once the hole is underground and we're drilling our fan, if we're targeting an undercut of a value here, we're looking for this separation to be 50 meters apart. That separation works for a geologist. It does not work for an engineer, but you know, we're we're just trying to, at this point, delineate as many ounces as we can at Parbeck. And we will focus in the Northwest where the Cadillac break bends and stays on the property, um, whereas it was previously thought to not bend. So that's a bit of an exciting area that'll involve a bit of a reinterpretation. Okay. Next question from William. Uh, Sir Mo, could you disclose the percentage of sulfites in the 200 meters of drilling, did you drill through the ultramafic into the rocks to the north? What are the rock types north of the ultramafic? We call it in the ultramafic bill in hole three. Um, in hole two, we, yeah, I believe we were all, we were in the ultramafic the whole, I believe we colored in both bodies. Um, the percentage of sulfide, I can't disclose it because I think in one of the slides, it talks to the geologist percentage um, in his logging. Um, but uh, what are the rocks north? We we're, It's sediments. It's just the, the country rock, it's sediments. I think unlike Parbeck where everything is sediments and subject to alteration, um, I think that the geologists are seeing the the ultramafic and the VMS more easily, but it's definitely sediments, and it's it's there's definitely an alteration story around the uh, the the intrusives or the the VMS. So I'm probably not answering your question, Bill, but I'll be able to answer it once I can once I have a better explanation from Dr. Franklin uh, to go with assay values for Surmo. I think it'll be a bit clearer then. 
but suffice to say, if you go through the presentation to the page where I show you the, um, the drill collars relative to the geophysics, um, those collars were picked in the field without the benefit of the geophysics. And it's actually caused us to reevaluate the historic drilling relative to the geophysics and what we see in the field. And uh, that's going into planning the next round. We want to, um, hole one was drilled to the east. Hole two was drilled at a crossroads of trails in the vicinity of a visible uh, trench. Hole three was backed up, was meant to undercut, but there were two more planned holes north to go through the complete package. Uh, it now looks like we didn't exit the package fully. And we certainly didn't go, we didn't enter the package from barren ground. Um, the estimate in the, is that the package is approximately 300 meters, give or take, wide in terms of north south uh, measurement on surface um, in, in total, both the ultramafic and the VMS. Um, but we don't have a complete transect with a drill yet. So can't begin to really answer your question. Okay. Um new question just came in from Mike. Could you expand more on marketing efforts? Yeah, uh, marketing efforts. Well, okay, so me, 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 me. It's all about me. Town hall today. Saturday, I'm doing a, a, a presentation to an investment club. I did one about a week and a half ago as well. Uh, happy to do those for people who have investment clubs or groups of buddies that invest together. That's all an investment club is. Um, Monday, uh, another interview with Crux. Um, I have done presentations and will be continuing to do pre presentations to various brokerage firms virtually. Um, what else is coming up? I have a German uh, interview. Well, I'll be doing it in English, but it's a German targeted interview um, probably next week to be followed up with some one-on-one -on -one meetings. Uh, I'm at the uh, Investors Day Follow the Money Group Investors Day um, is coming up. I'm at PDAC and I'm at NAI 500 does a Chinese investment community forum. Um, I will be doing that. Toronto based, there's a Chinese investment uh, letter and group, which I'll be working with. They will be renewing their coverage of um, Renforth and who else? There's a few little things in and around that. Um, there's a media company I'm talking to. I don't know what I'm doing with them yet in terms of just pure marketing, like uh, adver like advertising, like you see for regular companies, non-mining companies. So a few different initiatives have been, uh, have been started. Okay. Um, Andrew's asking, can you summarize your upcoming catalysts? Yeah, sure. Uh, drill results at Parbeck, probably the main catalyst. Uh, announcement of maiden drill results, discovery hole results at Surimo. Fully expect that to be a catalyst. Um, a drill turning is always exciting and the market gets excited, but really it's the release of assays, both our, our gold assays and then our, our nickel zinc copper assays. Uh, a longer term catalyst will be the restatement of the resource at Parbeck, but that's further out it's not that far out really, but it's further out than the, uh, the upcoming drill results. Um, Nicole, I know you've given guidance on Q2 for the mineral resource estimate at Parbeck. Do you have any finer guidance around like later in the quarter or earlier in the quarter? Probably right near the end of the quarter, to be honest with you. I mean, we're already halfway through, well, we're close to halfway through Q1 now. I expect what Parbeck will really look like is drilling commencing by the second week of February, drilling through February and probably through all of March, most of March anyway. Uh, the drillers are really good, but believe it or not, some rock is harder than other rock as well. So some stuff they go through like butter and some stuff slows them down. Um, so if we're drilling February, March, and we're looking at a six week turnaround from the lab worst case, then we are getting those results right through April into early May. Once the drilling is done with the results from the fall in hand, our geology team is going to, they're scheduling to start redoing the geological model in late April, early May. Once they've rebuilt the geological model with the new data, they will deliver that to the, a resource geologist. 
then how long does it take them to do their job? I would expect we might see an updated number in June. If we release an updated number, we have a 45 day clock for the associated technical report, which could well be into Q3. So I think our updated number is probably gonna, hopefully is gonna sneak in under the wire at the very end of Q2. Okay. Um, no more questions so far. I, I had a question while we wait for other ones perhaps. What, what, what are you doing for geophysics at Surmo this year? <laughs> Nothing yet. Dr. Franklin's already opined that, uh, in his opinion, um, most techniques will not be the most efficient. Uh, he has proposed um, that EM, if we can get it, will, uh, will be helpful. But what we are relying on is, um, and the imagery you see, and we've started working up some maps with it, is there's incredibly detailed mag that was flown um, by the Quebec government. So we're using that data set. It was flown in 2014, and it was flown on a it was flown low with helicopters. A former director who's passed away, actually, his company did that survey, and they got permission to fly incredibly low with helicopters, except where they had to go up because there were people around. Um, so that's a very robust data set. Um, if we do EM, it's going to be very specific um, over and above that. So that question is going to need to be informed by Dr. Franklin. Um, you know, our geologists are just accessing the resources they can right now. And I've asked them to not make any decisions as to new geophysics until we can uh, have the benefit of other opinions as well. So is Dr. Franklin, just a follow up to this, Nicole, is Dr. Well, again, there's no other questions for now, but the Dr. Franklin, is he kind of calling the shots or leading the charge on, on Suramo coordinating or what, what is his role exactly in the team? He's the, he's got the macro view and he has the worldwide experience and he will inform the project geologists. We have our own head geo. Uh, and then we have our currently two, uh, we have our, our uh, one field geo in Francis, who you see on the press releases. He has a geologist in training Sahil with him. Our other field geo, is at home with a kid due to COVID and, and all those, those changes. So he's working from home, but run force in-house kind of group of four on and off again, consulting geologists is on it. In addition to that, we have Dr. Franklin with the um, thousand foot view and the expertise to guide those guys and point them and line them up with what they should be looking at. In addition to that, we have Martin who is a Val d'Or geologist with ample experience as well as VMS experience um, further to the west, uh, he he was the one who who made the decision in the field where to drill the holes and log the core. Uh, so Martin will have a role um, on a more day to day basis. And then I have uh, my father who Rio, who uh, took an old property in the Iberian Pyrite Belt, which is a much more endowed in VMS terms part of the planet than the Apatibi and. Uh, reopened a mine while discovering a blind ore body um, in this mine. So he's very competent and capable as well with how to, uh, to um, handle VMS and how to develop VMS uh, and uh, turn it into an asset that somebody wants. So we have quite a team. Dr. Franklin absolutely has the overriding academic and experiential credentials to focus the team. But uh, Dr. Franklin is not in the field by any means. Um, he is guiding the field geologists, though. So. Okay. Um, with respect to, you know, potentially vending Parbeck to a buyer, would you expect offers to come after your resources mm -hmm. updated? Excuse have me. Yeah. Any, have you had any interesting conversations with groups lately? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. But everybody, I'm making it very clear to everyone that uh, prior to the current resource, we had a much more robust resource on a geological basis alone, which included the 1980s drill holes, which our, our regulators decided, one regulator decided he didn't want in the uh, database because we didn't have the core. He wanted the holes twinned. So we put out the engineered open pit without the benefit of those holes, as well as with the constraints that engineering brings to a resource. Um, and uh, we uh, we did that document, which is the 281,000 ounces. So I expect the next turnaround is going to be 
done by um, done without the focus on an open pit, uh, done with the benefit of the 1980s drill holes, done with the benefit of twinning, which gives an acquirer confidence in those drill holes, um, and done with the benefit of some new gold we're seeing. I don't know what the impact on the model is going to be of some of the some of the outside or unanticipated gold intervals we've been getting. So. Yeah, everybody's got to wait. Unless they want to pay on the basis of more than a half a million ounces in the ground, they've got to wait if they're if they're going to talk to me on the basis of 43101 resources. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions here, Nicole. I mean, we can, we can wait a minute or two if you want, or we can cut it off. It's up to you. No. Um, any closing comments then for everybody? Just a second. Okay, I have a private question I'm actually going to speak to. Why am I spending money tightening up the drilling? Because an acquirer would do that anyway. Well, in part because tightening up the drilling, let me be clear, we drilled 9,600 meters in 27 drill holes. Prior to that, there's 40,000 meters of drilling before we started that program in I forget how many drill holes um, at Parbeck. We didn't, we're not, we're not interleaving drill holes. When we page through our resource, when we look at it, when I look at it with our geologists, we look at our resource as a series of vertical sections. Um, that's as if you took our resource line this way and you took slices and you inserted pieces of paper vertically like that. Then you turn it around and you look at it, you're seeing the drill holes on each line. And the drill hole spacing is 50 meters apart. Sometimes it's 25 meters on section lines. Uh, we're fundamentally flipping through pages and where there's a gap, we're putting a hole in between. To be clear, our drill hole spacing is probably still 50 meters apart in a lot of instances. But that allows an interval that's here and an interval that's here and they're 100 or they're, they're 150 meters apart. A geologist cannot necessarily take the gamble that the resource, you know, the structure is continuous and gold bearing equally. It's gold. We have a nugget effect gold. We also have a flooded bulk tonnage target where there's gold everywhere, varying degrees. So if we put a hole in the middle, it just gives us more information, gives us more confidence. And this model has been vetted by other drilled by mining companies. And every geologist that looks at it draws the same conclusions of, okay, I'm comfortable here, I'm comfortable here, not too sure what's happening in here. So if we just plug that one hole in there, we're demonstrating continuity of mineralization or tenor of mineralization across our full strike. So we're very much not lacking holes. And we're also doing a lot of down dip extension drilling where if we have a hole here and we have a hole here, let me do this so you can see it. I don't, my hands don't work that way. If we have two holes like this, they're in line, but they're separate. We're putting a hole that does this. So if this hole hits, it gives us a deeper pierce point in the same, the structures all run vertical. So the same structure that was hit here and here, going like that vertically, we're gonna hit it down here. It'll give us confidence there, but it'll give us a depth extension. So our drill pattern in a lot of instances is doing this. It's not doing that. So we're maximizing the return of data on an infill basis. So we're doing a few fun things with the drill. I don't think we're wasting money. We, we spent maybe $1.2 million uh, on the drill program that we've done. And, uh, you know, I think we, we will have, we will prove that we will add much more than $1.2 million in resource value. So that was just sitting in my private uh, questions. I wanted to speak to it in case anyone else had that question. So is there anything else, John? Or no, That's it. But that, that was good info. I think that was a good question to, to tackle. So, yeah, that's all for now. Um, thanks, everybody, for attending. Um, Nicole is, is one of the most approachable CEOs I know. Uh, if you do have follow-up questions from this, you know, reach out to her. There will be a survey at the end of the webinar. Uh, if you fill it out, one of the questions is, you know, do you want management to, to uh, contact you? If you answer yes to that, uh, we pass that information on to Nicole and she'll, uh, she'll arrange to contact you. So any closing remarks, Nicole, before we shut it down? No, um, 
I'm reachable. Take the handout. I think you can all get a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, follow social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, um, and stay tuned. We got lots of news coming up and we're in a very, very interesting part of the world. So, uh, and I think we're headed into a good market. So stay tuned. And if you do have any questions, email me, phone me, message me. Um, I'll reply. So thank you for your time. I hope you're a happy Renfor shareholder. And if you're not a shareholder, you should be a shareholder. There you go. Okay, everybody, stay safe, take care until next time. And thanks again for your uh, participation. Thanks, guys.